Welcome to the New Books Network. Hi, welcome to Darts and Letters. I'm producer Jay. Today we're actually running a really recent episode. We just finished this last week in the wake of the huge Rogers outage which took 10 million Canadians offline for a full day. We wanted to look at how telecoms might be done differently, specifically the internet. Because part of the problem in North America, and especially here in Canada, is that the internet is run by a very small number of mega corporations. As you'll hear Gordon say, this country is all oligopoly, all the way down. So as part of this week's theme of the politics of tech and techno-utopias, we figured we'd run this episode about Canada's dystopian internet present, and what a more democratic, public internet might look like and we ask how and whether we might get there. This is a very recent episode, but on New Books Network, we're running episodes from our back catalogue each week within a different theme, so you can catch up with some of our best stuff until we relaunch the show on September 18th. If you are enjoying Darts and Letters here on New Books Network, then we'd love it if you went and hit the subscribe or follow button on our podcast feed in Apple or Spotify or Stitcher or wherever you listen to podcasts. Maybe I should just say on the internet. And on the internet now, a podcast about the internet. I should probably warn you, we got pretty uh, creative with the intro on this one. From Cited Media, this is Darts and Letters. I'm Gordon Caddick. My name is Jack Cole, and we are here in Toronto at the headquarters offices of Rogers Communications. This interview is with Ted Rogers. Ted, we're going to start with you because uh, I know you have a long and storied heritage in communications. Why don't you tell us something about that? Um, Like so many people in the cable and broadcasting industries, uh, family plays a big role. Uh, And in my case, my father father invented the the alternating alternating current 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 tube. tube. Disconnected. Reconnecting. Reconnecting. Why? Because he got tangled up with all of these things that are going on the internet commercially. And here we have this one situation where enormous entities want to use the Internet for their purpose to save money for doing what they're doing now. And again, the Internet is not something that you just dump something on. It's not a big truck. It's it's a series of tubes. The Internet is not a big truck. The Internet is not something that you just dump something on. The Internet is not... The Internet is not a big truck. The Internet is a series of tubes. Welcome to Rogers. For English, press 1. Pour le français, faites le 2. Let me put you through to our 100% Canadian based customer solution specialist for more help. Millions of Canadians don't have access to the internet or cell phone service. A massive outage is affecting. The day long outage also disrupting government services and payment systems like Interact. Rogers CEO did apologize for the disruption in a letter to customers. The company has now said it knows what's wrong. We're back, folks. We've said this joke before, and I guess we have to say it again. This country is just three corporations under a trench coat. It's all oligopoly all the way down, nowhere more so than in telecommunications. Three companies dominate traffic, and when one goes down, the whole country does. So today on the program, we try to imagine a better way. We look for an internet for the people. Anti-monopoly is part of that, but what about a socially democratic internet? 
Today I'm joined by Ben Tarnoff. He's a tech journalist, and his new book is called Internet for the People, The Fight for Our Digital Future. Today on Darts and Letters, we socialize the tubes. Stay tuned. You're listening to Darts and Letters. If you like what you hear and you want to support us, why don't you subscribe? You can do that wherever you find your podcasts, or you can find us at dartsandletters.ca. Okay, back to the show. Ben Tarnoff, welcome to the program. Hey, Gordon. Thanks so much for having me. I'm so excited to talk to you about your new book, uh, Internet for the People. I think it's like such an important uh, intervention in the kind of... um, in the tech lash, and I, I want to talk a little bit more about what that is and how how your account of it kind of differs in a really interesting way. But maybe to start, I can't help but to uh, ask you about the situation in Canada, which <laughs> Canadian uh, telecom oligopolies make the case in the United States look like some hyper-competitive, decentralized, <laughs> Matt Stoller dream, you know, like sure, <laughs> it, is, sure. uh, it is a whole lot worse here. So what happened, um, the Rogers communication network was down, which accounted for about 25% of the entirety of Canadian internet traffic. So about 10 million people didn't have internet. This is the second major Rogers outage. And um, thus far, all they have have come up with is a couple days of bill credits. And the government is asking the telecoms to come up with some kind of deal, essentially, where in cases like this, they would sort of collectively try and solve the problem by sharing each other's networks or something like that. I mean, that's essentially the, the horizon of political possibilities how would an internet for the people, like how would you go about facing this kind of issue? You know, it's funny as an American watching the Rogers outage from my vantage point, because I think we often have this somewhat naive view of Canada as perhaps taking a saner approach to public policy, somewhat less deregulatory. But of course, as you point out, with telecommunications, you have an intensely concentrated market, as as we do. And there are kind of different histories behind those. But, you know, that introduces these massive vulnerabilities, you know, where you have these very large firms that are essentially extractive, that are drawing fees, often exorbitant fees from their customers, funneling them upwards into the pockets of investors and executives and failing to invest appropriately in infrastructure, which produces the kind of breakdowns that we've seen, obviously at an enormous scale with with the latest Rogers outage, but you know, at smaller scales all, all over the place that that don't even make the news. You know, my perspective broadly is that if the profit motive is the principle by which connectivity is distributed then millions of people will necessarily be either underconnected or entirely unconnected. And I think we've seen that in the United States where my work is focused quite clearly. We have, in addition to you know, frequent outages because of this highly predatory business model, we also, and I can speak more specifically here to the American context, have a severe crisis of connectivity. More than 162 million Americans, which is nearly half of the country, do not access the internet at broadband speeds. As you might expect, the un and underconnected are disproportionately rural folks, low-income folks, people of color. And what they don't get access to is not a luxury. Internet access is not a luxury in 2022. It's a basic precondition for participation in economic, social, cultural, civic life. I think we've seen this with the pandemic. We see the United States in the early days of the pandemic, we had people fleeing to the parking lots of churches and other community organizations that put out Wi-Fi networks because they had to apply for unemployment insurance. They had to work from home. Their kids had to take classes from home. And they couldn't do so because there wasn't a decent internet connection at home. So we have a very severe social crisis in this country. And to my mind, profit maximization is to blame. I'd like to begin uh, the conversation of your book sort of defining our terms, which which is a surprisingly difficult thing to do in this conversation. Like, what is the internet? <laughs> but, you know, you start the book talking really about, you know, an undersea fiber optic line 
And the book really does remind us of the materiality of the internet. And reading it, you know, I was reflecting on, I can't remember when this was, but it was kind of in the John Stewart days. Remember when Ted Stevens said the internet is a series of tubes and, and everyone mm-hmm. kind of um, mocked him for that phrase and it became kind of this meme. And now I'm thinking like, oh, there are a lot of tubes in the internet, aren't there? <laughs> like, um, Certainly. Basic, uh, basically what I'm asking, to what extent was, uh, was Ted Stevens right all along? Is the internet a series of tubes? <laughs> <laughs> it is. Indeed it is. And, you know, there's a great book about how the internet works called tubes. So, you know, tubes is, uh, is a good metaphor. I mean, I think to your original question, it's surprisingly difficult to succinctly define what the internet is. And that was surprising to me when I started working on this book, because we talk and think so much about the internet that we take for granted that we know what it is. But when we scratch the surface a bit and try to actually give the two sentence version the paragraph version it's it's much harder than we may have expected for me the internet is best understood as a language it's a language that enables different computer networks to interconnect with one another and thus to form a global network of networks concretely the language is implemented as a protocol which in computing is simply a set of rules for how computers can communicate with one another. And this protocol is first developed in the 1970s and then greatly developed and expanded over the subsequent decades. But this language of the internet, which if you like is a kind of digital Esperanto that allows this universality of computer communication across different networks, this language of the internet is spoken across particular structures. And those structures, as you point out, Gordon, are material. They're fiber optic cables that run under the oceans, that track continental coastlines. They are big data centers, racks of routers, all sorts of stuff, heavy stuff that you can touch with your hands through which this language is operational, if you like. So all that hardware would be lifeless without the language. It needs to be animated by this language, if you like. But conversely, without all the hardware, the language would not be able to be spoken. I think it's such a nice reminder that the internet isn't just like an idea that someone came up with, but took an enormous amount of investment, uh, mostly public investment, to create a really quite robust infrastructure. And I'd love to go through some of those kind of key points. Like I think that people understand kind of in a general sense that the internet came out of state funding and and, and state projects, but maybe they don't know the sort of particular. So if you could just kind of take us through some of the key beats, like like from the start with DARPA and ARPANET, I mean, what what was kind of the first internet? Maybe the most interesting way to start the story is to talk about the launch of Sputnik in the late 1950s. Moscow newspapers were first. Then headlines around the world echoed the news. Russia had blasted a man-made moon into outer space. On every continent and in every land, the story of Sputnik 1 dominated the front pages. The Soviets had scored a scientific first, and the Moscow propaganda mill busily trumpeted the news. This triggers a collective freakout in the American policymaking establishment because they feel, oh God, the Soviets are outpacing us in science and technology. We need to make major investments in order to catch up. Soviet films of student groups tracking the satellite underscore the emphasis on science in Russian schools. It is a challenge that President Eisenhower has said America must meet to survive in the space age. One of the outcomes of this is the creation of DARPA, which is the Pentagon's R&D arm. By the early 1960s, DARPA has decided to make significant investments in computing and in computer networking. So by the end of the 1960s, they have created this cutting edge computer network called ARPANET. ARPANET uses a new technology called packet switching, which is quite revolutionary because it involves 
breaking a message down into a number of different discrete units called packets. So this computer network, ARPANET, connects computers, which we have to remember in the 1960s are enormous mainframes. They take up whole floors. They cost millions of dollars. These computers at different sites across the country are connected through ARPANET. Now, that's very well and good if you are a DARPA contractor sitting at a mainframe in Northern Virginia and you want to talk to a mainframe, let's say, at Stanford. But what if you wanted to bring computing power out from those big fixed sites and into the field? That is, how could you make computing power available to soldiers deployed in the field? This is the dream that motivates the first internet experiments. And these occur in the mid-1970s. As we said before, the internet is a language. So the first internet protocol that is written and implemented is done so with precisely this scenario in mind, which is how could a soldier in a Jeep in Vietnam, for example, using a small, not particularly powerful computer in the back of their Jeep, access a program running on a much more powerful mainframe in Northern Virginia? How could computing power be brought to the service of war making? And this is why they create the internet protocol, at least this is the, the pretext for funding the initiative, which is that through this universal language of the internet, it would be possible to stitch together a global network of networks such that packets could travel from that mainframe in Northern Virginia all the way across the world to the Jeep in Vietnam. Such a, a typical case, right? I mean, that's the history of science and, and technology. It's always dual use uh, science and technology coming out of uh, military uh, imperatives. I'm curious, I mean, to use the kind of tech bro term, like the use case, like what is the soldier in the Jeep going to be able to even access? Like what kind of, like a map of, of like what kind of information would they have wanted to convey to them? Well, so one of the, uh, examples that they actually do uh, run, you know, one of the many experiments here is a situation in which you have a smaller computer on a tarmac. And the task is to figure out how to load a large cargo plane, which is actually a pretty difficult thing to do. Because if you think about it, you need to maximize the space in the hold of a cargo plane, you need to space it out properly depending on whether the cargo plane is going to land under enemy fire, it may have to take evasive action. In other words, there's a lot of inputs to this decision of how to make the plan. And one of the experiments that they run with the early internet protocol is, okay, we're going to put a little computer on the tarmac, and that computer is going to be using the internet protocol to speak to a mainframe somewhere else. And that mainframe is going to be running a program that takes certain user input and then provides the optimal load plan for the aircraft. So that was one experiment they did to try to demonstrate the utility of the internet. Now we should say this is the dream that produced the internet, but the internet protocol as it is developed in the mid 1970s and beyond is not actually used for this purpose. It's not used for the guy in the Jeep in Vietnam. What the Pentagon decides to use it for is actually something much more prosaic, which is that it has a handful of fixed line networks, you know, computer networks like ARPANET, and it needs to find a way for these networks to interconnect, to communicate with one another, because they speak, if you like, their own provincial dialects, and they there is a use for a kind of digital Esperanto to bring all of those networks together. So that's what the Pentagon uses it for, and the internet as a place, not just a protocol, but as a discrete collection of computer networks, thus comes into existence in the 1980s as the Pentagon uses this new protocol to interconnect its various networks. You know, one of the things you talk about in the book is just how much investment is necessary to sort of make this possible. And, you know, I'm curious, like, 
you talk about how you know it would have been sort of suicidal for a private corporation to do these kinds of things. I mean, would it have been possible to have an internet that wasn't created out of just like generous state subsidy? Well, there are various cases where the Pentagon basically asked the private sector, could you build us something like this? And they say, no, we can't see the money in it. DARPA didn't want to build ARPANET itself. It asked AT&T whether they'd be interested in building a packet switch network. And the executives couldn't see the money in it. It was also a paradigm that was completely different than what they were used to. I mean, packet switching was quite revolutionary compared to how the traditional telephone system worked. Once ARPANET was up and running, DARPA even offered it to AT&T to, to run for them, and they said no. So much for private vision and, and innovation, right? Precisely. And I think this is something that's counterintuitive for a lot of folks. But the private sector, when it comes to the type of ambitious and patient research that tends to generate breakthrough innovations, is risk averse, which makes sense because they are answerable to investors. They can only spend so much on research. We saw this in the case of Google. You know, Google was famous for its moonshots, and eventually Wall Street managed to discipline it and say, look, you've got to rein in some of the spending if it's not going to produce products that pay for itself. So the federal government, and let's say particularly the Pentagon at the height of the Cold War, was uniquely positioned to spend billions and billions of dollars on these very patient funding schemes in order to generate technologies that... The motivation here, of course, that these technologies would someday be useful for waging war, but it was still a blue sky outfit, which is to say researchers still had a fair bit of discretion in terms of the, what projects they wanted to pursue and how they wanted to pursue it. So you're right about the internet representing a truly massive level of investment from the public sector. And I think that's something that we need to foot stomp for people because often you know, there is a general understanding that the internet came out of the government and specifically the military. But what we're talking about is something that had to be created literally from scratch. There's a legal activist named Nathan Newman who makes this point quite effectively, where he says, look, the internet is often compared to the federal highway system. And of course, in the 1990s, the internet was called the information superhighway. So this was a metaphor that was on people's minds. Federal highway system, of course, similarly being a very large public project. But Newman goes on to say that comparison only really makes sense if you could think of a scenario in which the federal government invented the internal combustion engine, invented asphalt, <laughs> staffed all of the firms necessary to produce all of these things. In other words, everything had to be made from the bottom up. And that is part of why privatization, when it begins in the 1990s, is such an astonishing move and how extreme that form of privatization is. Because you have a technology that has been created from scratch through billions of dollars of public investment over decades, and then it's quite rapidly and quite comprehensively ceded to the private sector. The National Science Foundation and the NSF Net steps into this story at, at a certain point when the internet undergoes a bit of a transformation. Can you tell me a little bit about that next step? What was NSFNet? So the National Science Foundation is a federal agency tasked with supporting basic research. And by the early 1990s, the internet is now under the direction of the NSF. So it's still a federally managed system, but it's now civilianized. It's not directly being controlled by the Pentagon. And the National Science Foundation operates the backbone of the internet at the time, the backbone meaning the core artery of the internet, the kind of deepest and, and most centrally located network of the internet. And this is called NSFNet. And in addition to running this backbone, the National Science Foundation subsidizes regional networks that are nonprofit across the country in order to help people get connected to the internet. So by the early 1990s, the internet is widely available to US academics and researchers. And you know, if you're a uh, college student, typically you would be using the internet on a college campus. So on the one hand, 
the internet has become much more widely available than it had been prior. But on the other hand, the demand continues to far exceed the capacity. In other words, a lot of people want to get online. And that's in part because by the early 1990s, you have the beginnings of the World Wide Web. You have the first graphical web browsers like Netscape Navigator. You have an internet that is becoming more interactive, richer, more usable. If you think about the older internet, you tended to need somewhat specialized technical skills to use it. It was a text-only interface. It wasn't very fun for most people. But now the internet is becoming more appealing. So the National Science Foundation faces a crisis of sorts where it needs to find a way to expand capacity in the face of soaring demand. And why do they choose the route of privatization rather than, I mean, what would have the alternative been? Privatization was the plan all along in the sense that the federal government had no intention of running the internet indefinitely. The question was always timing. And because of this rising demand by people who wanted to get online, the National Science Foundation decides to move up the timetable to privatize the internet faster than it had expected to. The crucial date here is April 1995. And in April 1995, the National Science Foundation terminates NSFNet, that backbone of the internet, and the private sector takes over. Now, privatization takes a particularly extreme form, despite the massive public investment required to create the internet from scratch. There is no compensation for this move. There is no enduring public or non-commercial foothold in the internet. Further, the government doesn't prescribe any rules for how the new privately owned backbones can interconnect with one another. So it's a form of privatization that essentially quite quickly ensures a near total corporate dictatorship over the infrastructure of the internet. And I think in, in my view, lays the foundation for a series of later moves that have created the broken internet that we have today. Mm. Returning to kind of like my first question about materiality, I mean, what does that actually mean in the context of privatization? Are we, are we looking at like lines and switches and, and, and things that are essentially given away? I mean, what, what does privatization look like in a, in a kind of visceral sense? You're right that it's important here to be precise about our definitions, because privatization can sometimes mean quite literally the transfer of public assets to the private sector. So if you think about, let's say, a port, the government owns and operates a port, it's sold off to a private firm. In the case of the privatization of the internet, what privatization means is something a bit different, which is the programming of the profit motive into every layer of the network. This is a network that, as we've discussed, was created by the government, was run and managed and developed by research scientists. It had to be renovated from the ground up for the purposes of profit maximization. So when we think about the privatization of the internet, it's a process, not an event. There are inflection points like 1995, but it actually takes a long time and it requires interventions at a variety of different levels. What happens quite literally in April 1995 is not that the National Science Foundation hands over a bunch of routers and switchers and cables to the private sector. What happens is it terminates its own infrastructure. And crucially, because the National Science Foundation ran the backbone of the internet, because it was the agency that was subsidizing all of these regional nonprofit networks that were enabling people to get online in the first place. It had immense power to determine the terms of the transition. It was in the driver's seat when it came to what would this future internet look like. And it decides to let industry unilaterally dictate the terms of that transition. So it's a somewhat subtler move here than just saying, here is the internet as a thing, because of course the internet is, is kind of too complicated for that to be the case. It's, it's more that the federal government, and in particular in this case, the National Science Foundation, abdicates its responsibility to set out a different 
path forward. This period of privatization, I mean, we should put a finer point on it and, and remind people that this is the Clinton era and the third way Democrats who are radically transforming um, the vision of government. And, and you say in the book, like the FDR style social democracy is completely dead at this point. And so you have a kind of convergence of, you know, right wing libertarianism with third way kind of Clintonism that seems to be like a unique maelstrom. You know, the internet came sort of at the worst time, I guess, to be sort of publicly managed because of the political forces. You know, but when, but when you write that in the book that, you know, social FDR style social democracy is dead, it, it got me thinking, well, OK, like l thought experiment, like let's imagine that FDR style social democracy wasn't dead and the Internet was maturing at this time, you know, in the mid 90s. What would have the alternate choice? What might it have been? One of the things I try to point out in my book is that there were always alternative paths that the internet could have taken. And there were always alternative proposals that people were putting forward about how the internet might evolve that turned that would have created a different internet than the one we know today. In the, the early 90s, Senator Daniel Inouye of Hawaii actually puts forward a Senate bill that would have reserved up to 20% of the capacity of the telecoms reserved it for so-called public uses. So this capacity would have been provided for free to qualifying institutions that serve the public like libraries. And further, there would have been a funding stream available to those institutions to develop their own content and programming. One of the major sources of inspiration for this idea was public media. You know, we talked about FDR. Of course, one of the features of the FDR era was the rise of radio. And thanks to a social movement, a portion of radio spectrum was set aside for non-commercial uses. Same with television spectrum. And that was the animating principle behind Inoue's proposal. Activists at the time called it a public lane on the information superhighway. So that was one proposal. There were a number of others. But of course, what we didn't have in the 1990s was a social movement that could have made these ideas active, that could have made them feasible in the face of immense industry opposition. And as you point out, not only do you have quite strong telecom lobbying in this period, but you have a broad ideological consensus around the need for the private sector to take command. And that's reflected on the one hand, as you pointed out, by Clintonism, and on the other hand, by Newt Gingrich's Republicans in Congress. Gingrich, in particular, was a kind of poster boy of techno libertarianism. You know, he's interviewed favorably in Wired magazine. He's kind of positioning himself in this era as a kind of cool kid of internet deregulation. So it is a perfect storm, if you like, of material and ideological conditions for privatization to take an especially extreme form. You talk about a lot of different platforms, uh, and you don't like that term. I'll ask you about that, but you know, eBay and Amazon and Uber and others, and can't really get into all of them in 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 tons of detail. But I wanted to ask you about why you reject the term sort of platform when when talking about these these tech behemoths. I don't love the term platform because I think it mystifies and obfuscates what these systems really are. You know, platforms suggest neutrality, openness, even handedness. It suggests that these companies are not, in fact, intimately involved in legislating our online experiences as we know that they are. So it's a term that, you know, originally has a more specific technical meaning of being a set of components that developers can build applications on top of. But platform has now become this very flexible term that essentially refers to any piece of software that's running on the internet. And I think it does do this work of, of suggesting a kind of neutrality that in fact does not exist. So as an alternative to the term platform, I suggest thinking of them as online shopping malls, as essentially the online equivalent of, of the shopping mall that we all know. And I think this helps clarify the ways in which they they actually operate. 
if you think about a shopping mall, a mall is is essentially a privately owned public space. It's a corporate enclosure with all sorts of different interactions transpiring inside of it. Some of these interactions are social. If you're a suburban teenager, you probably go to the shopping mall to hang out with your friends. Some of these transactions are commercial. Go to the shopping mall to buy things. The crucial thing about the online mall, however, is that everything that one does within the walls of these enclosures produces data. And this data, as we know, can be processed and monetized in a variety of different ways. I draw on the work here of the scholar Jathan Sadowski, who points out that shopping malls are offline shopping malls are in the rental business. You know, they're charging rent to merchants for a particular spot in a shopping mall. Online malls can also charge monetary rents. If you think about the case of Uber, they're taking a fee for each ride. But crucially, they also charge data rents, which is they manufacture data about all of these different interactions that are transpiring within the enclosure. And this is the true source of their power and the true source of profit. And they they regulate the terms of the transactions. I, one of the interesting parts about your book, you look at kind of the techno-libertarian optimism of eBay, right, as, as trying to be kind of a perfect market. But quickly they realize that that doesn't really work. And so then it becomes a much more tightly regulated space. So anti-monopoly is in the news. It has been for a long time. It comes up in your book a lot. Um, it's something that with Lena Khan um, in the United States, there's a lot of energy and attention on, obviously, with the EU. It doesn't go all the way, though. I mean, t- tell me a little bit about what you see as kind of the promise, but also the limitations of thinking about the problems of our internet as simply a monopoly problem. Well, look, I think anti-monopoly gives us a valuable toolkit with which we can begin to constrain the power of these big firms and to shrink their footprint. So I think there's a lot to be said for anti-monopoly as an approach. I think where I part ways with the anti-monopoly folks is in our diagnosis of what the problem is. I don't think that the problem of the internet is that markets are insufficiently competitive. And I don't want markets to simply work better In contrast, I want markets to matter less because to my mind, the problem is not excessively consolidated market. The problem is the market itself. And I'll give you an example. We've been talking about severe inequalities in broadband access in the United States. And this is often presented as a monopoly problem because we have four firms that control 76% of internet subscriptions in this, in this country. They actively collaborate to avoid competing with one another. And research has shown that if you add more entrants to a local market, speeds go up and rates go down. But what the data also shows is that competition tends to work best for the customers who are worth competing for which is to say the downward pressure on pricing mostly occurs for the higher end broadband plans. And I think this points to an important point, which is that even under more competitive conditions, millions of people will remain bad customers because they're too poor to afford internet service, because they live in locations, rural areas, low income areas in which there simply isn't infrastructure. And making the investments to bring these people online, to get them connected, is never going to pay for itself, even in a more competitive environment. We can move up the stack and talk about some of the limitations of anti-monopoly as a paradigm with the so-called platforms. One comes to mind is Facebook. If you think about a company like Facebook, as we've seen reported endlessly in the press, much of the destructive power of Facebook lies in the fact that it was optimized from the ground up to maximize user engagement. That means that its filtering algorithms tend to favor sensationalistic, provocative, hateful, bigoted content with all sorts of deleterious social consequences. Now, that imperative to maximize user engagement at all costs came out of an era of relative competition, came out of an era when Facebook was trying to 
grab market share as quickly as possible, to grow as fast as possible. So the idea that simply adding more competition to the markets of the internet, to having more competitors to Facebook, would do anything to solve that deeper problem, I think is misleading. I think we really need to think that more clearly about the fact that the profit motive and profit maximization as the organizing principle of the internet is the core issue here. It's not how profit is pursued by larger or smaller firms. What would that look like? You have a lot of um, promising examples in your book of like deprivatizing the internet and making it more driven by public interest and public control. What in your mind are sort of the more, most promising examples to build around? Well, what I call for in the book, as you point out, Gordon, is deprivatization. And to my mind, deprivatization means creating an internet where people and not profit rule. So the goal is to create structures that can diminish the power of the profit motive, that can shrink the space of the market instead of making markets work better, and to encode practices of democratic control so that ordinary people can participate in the decisions that most affect them. Now, when it comes to the pipes, the so-called bottom of the stack, the physical infrastructure, I think the way forward is pretty clear. One of the things that I talk about in the book is the success of more than 900 so-called community networks in the United States, which are broadband networks that are run, for instance, by a local municipality, publicly owned, or by the users themselves, cooperatively owned. One of the things that I think is very promising about community networks is the ability for them to bring people together into space and have in-person, face-to-face, deliberative, democratic decision-making about how infrastructure is going to be deployed. And as a result, are able to get people connected much more effectively and much more democratically, if you like, than their corporate counterparts. When we move up the stack to the application layer of the internet, where the sites and the apps live, where we experience the internet, the strategies for deprivatization become more diverse and more complex. And that's, I think, by necessity. Because if you think about a company like Facebook, Facebook is much more complicated in its computational systems than a company like Comcast. And further, Facebook is a lot more different to a company like Uber than Comcast is to AT&T. So there is a complexity and diversity at this layer of the internet that we have to acknowledge. And I think accordingly, our deprivatization strategies have to be comparably complex and diverse. So in the book, I point to a number of promising experiments that give us some possible ways forward for how we might think about deprivatizing these different realms of the application layer. I talk, for instance, about Mastodon, an open source project in decentralized social media where people can launch their own social media servers and then interconnect them using open protocols, which is the same principle that the internet itself runs on, to form federations. And people are using Mastodon in particular to experiment with things like cooperatively owned social media sites where content moderation decisions are made democratically by the users themselves. We could also point to worker-owned app-based services, you know, worker-owned ride-hailing apps that are competitors to corporate counterparts like Uber. That's really exciting. That's one of the parts that I think the anti-monopoly vision kind of misses because, you know, we could talk about price and we could talk about access and we talk about reliability till the cows come home. And that's really important. But democratic will, democratic control of over sort of authoring our tech future and our and, and our tech present is something that demands another approach. And and you just talked a little bit about that with Mastodon. But I'm I'm, I'm just curious to ask you a little bit more about that. I mean, what what is the kind of radical democratic vision for what an internet a publicly democratically managed internet could look like. I mean, give us the sort of pitch about why, why even that matters to us. Well, it's been easier these days to make the case to people why it matters 
you know, because I think on the, on the one hand, people are often just fed up with how, frankly, spammy and unusable a lot of the current services are. I mean, I feel that way every time I look at Facebook. It's just a nightmare. But also, I think people have become much more aware of the social consequences of some of these products and services. You know, Facebook in particular, I think there's a much wider awareness of what are the consequences of the power of a company like Facebook? How does it help spread right-wing propaganda? How does it, you know, have these quite destructive effects on our civic and political life? So that has to be part of the conversation. It's not simply a consumerist appeal that says, well, I think you might enjoy this product a bit better. It's also a political one that says, hey, there are actually costs associated with these different services, and we need to think about these things holistically. Now, there are limitations here. I don't, I'm not suggesting that we move everyone from Twitter and Facebook to Mastodon and call it a day. Mastodon is very much an experiment. It is limited. It has serious resource constraints. It doesn't have billions of dollars at its disposal in order to develop. And further, it is, if you like, imprisoned by an enemy paradigm. You know, it is copied off of these corporate services. And to my mind, if we really want to create an internet for the people, we have to go further. It's a good first step to say, what would a cooperatively owned Twitter look like? What would a cooperatively owned Uber look like? But at the end of the day, these are enemy architectures that encode certain imperatives into their technical structures. And if we want to create a genuinely qualitatively different way of being online, we have to create new architectures. So one of the things I talk about in the book is the need to use public policy to develop spaces in which ordinary people can come in, get connected with the technical expertise that they need to build entirely new online services that serve their everyday needs. This collective embodied financed process of experimentation is ultimately what I believe will give us the, an internet for the people. That's very exciting. It, it, it's, it's hard to imagine because I don't think there's been enough radical imagination, like in a way, we're, we're, what are we even looking to? We're looking back to, you know, there was a, a, a utopian vision in the early days, but we're, we're looking forward. And and um, like you said, we're trapped, but we're too trapped in the existing paradigm to even imagine what a radically different internet could look like. And that's that's super exciting to do. One of the challenges, I guess, in doing that is that there's a perception at least, that government is particularly inept, uneducated, and ham-fisted when it, when it comes to technological innovation and policy and whatnot. And, and, and there's some resonance to this. I mean, you think about in the, in the context of, of Canada, I mean, we had a, a COVID app that was basically in a, a complete boondoggle in the United States, of course, what happened when the Obama administration put up those healthcare exchanges and they they immediately crashed? How do we overcome that public perception that that they're only going to screw it up? This is, you know, more broadly a problem. I mean, this is not limited to software development. This is a problem, a, a much a much more difficult problem, which is that all sorts of capacities that the public sector formerly had, it has outsourced to the private sector, that it increasingly can't do things itself. So broadly, that is a capacity problem. It's not an absolute loss of capacity. It's that the capacity has frankly been reallocated. I mean, the, the US state is as powerful as ever, but what it prefers to spend its money and time on is caging and killing people, not providing social services, not building infrastructure, and so on. I would say in the case of the public sector, the demonstration effect is a very powerful thing. And part of why the telecoms have been so bitterly opposed to these community networks that we've been discussing is because they fear the power of a good example. Even if it's a small network that serves a small community, if the word got out that you could have a publicly owned broadband network that provides better service at lower cost, 
then Comcast and actually enables you and other community members to participate in decisions about how the network is going to be run, that's terrifying for the telecoms. So that's part of what we have to do. And that is working at the level of imagination. You know, one of the successes of the neoliberal project has been to come into government to slash and undermine certain services and then point to them when they fail and say government can't possibly do those things anyway, right? They've produced their own examples to substantiate their own ideology. And we have to do the same on our end. Absolutely. You know, I think you're careful in the book to not say this is my manifesto or program or my prescribed set of policy recommendations to create the Ben Tarnoff internet. But I am kind of curious if you could give me a sense of what kind of ideals and what would your kind of radically democratic internet for the people, what might it look like? Well, I did an adapted excerpt from the book in uh, the New York Times. And this is one thing the editors pushed me on was like, okay, I want to see it concretely. What does this look like? <laughs> and, you know, as you point out, I have some reluctance about being excessively programmatic because on the one hand, I think you need to give people some examples to make it concrete, but I don't want to put myself in the position of dictating the precise blueprint. Inevitably, the blueprint itself will have to change because part of my argument is that we need a process of experimentation to develop new ideas. That said, in the piece, I have a kind of science fiction-y <laughs> scenario in which you wake up one morning, you grab a cup of coffee, that hasn't changed fortunately, and you log on to a social media site that is run by your local library in which librarians are present to help contextualize and classify and curate information. They essentially help play the role of maintaining the health of the information environment, if you like. And on this local social media site, you're engaged in conversations about, say, an upcoming municipal election, about things that are going on in your community. But critically, because this site is federated through open protocols with sites throughout the country and throughout the world, you're also able to exchange messages with people elsewhere. Now, content moderation decisions in this scenario are made at the local level. They're made with members of your other local community in in-person settings. You all get together at the local library and decide, how is information going to travel in our site? But it's not an isolated site. You are still able to connect to this wider group. So the internet remains global, but its governance in this respect is local, and thus the possibility of in-person deliberation. Admittedly, this is not the most imaginative possible <laughs> scenario. These are this is an attempt to think through a near future based on stuff that more or less exists in the present. So there are some limitations here. But I think these experiments, you know, all these things exist, as we've been discussing. These experiments do help us denaturalize the internet as it exists. And that might be their most important effect to teach people there's nothing inevitable about the internet that we have. It's possible to imagine, and not just imagine, but actually to implement some pretty interesting alternatives. But if we want to go further, we need public investment. And we need a social movement that's capable of demanding public investment. These things can continue to operate at the fringes, but if we want to bring them into the mainstream, if we want to make them more robust, more imaginative, and crucially more of a threat to the big firms, we need public investment. That was Ben Tarnoff. His new book is called Internet for the People, The Fight for Our Digital Future. That's out now from Verso Books. And that's it for this week's episode of Darts and Letters. We are produced by Jay Coburn, Mark Apollonio, and Ren Bangert. Our marketing assistant is Ian Souten. As always, our theme song and outro is composed by Mike Barber. Our graphic designs are by Dakota Coop, and I'm your host and editor, Gordon Caddick. <laughs>
This episode was part of a wider series that looks at the politics of technology. It received funding from the Social Sciences and Humanities Research Council of Canada. The scholarly leads on this project are Professors Tanner Murleys at Ontario Tech University and Imra Zeman at the University of Waterloo. We are also backed by our generous patrons. Join us and join them by going to patreon.com forward slash darts and letters. Thanks for listening. Check back in in two weeks.